Adventure games, a somewhat forgotten genre, but one that I spent playing in my formative gaming years as a little kid. Before I really jumped into console gaming on my brother's PlayStation 1 and our Nintendo 64, after having played Super Mario World on a Super Nintendo that to this day, I still don't know exactly where it came from, I played Humongous Entertainment's adventure games for kids on PC. Freddy Fish, Pajama Sam, Putt Putt, Spy Fox, delightful cartoon animation, and tough puzzles for a 10 and under crowd, of course, were my absolute favorite thing. The problem solving, the fun characters, the adventure genre let me work at my own pace and just soak in the world the games took place in. Hell, I would make up my own adventures in my head and just run around the environments in the game just doing nothing. <sighs> Remember imagination? So with that in mind, it's not surprising that one of the first console games I loved to play as a kid was Blazing Dragons for the PlayStation 1. Everyone remembers this game, right? Yeah, Blazing Dragons. For those who don't know, which brutally honest, I assume most everyone, Blazing Dragons was a point and click adventure game developed by the Illusions Gaming Company, a group that developed a limited number of adventure game titles based on established properties like Scooby-Doo and Beavis and Butthead of all things. You can only expect to get out what you put in, okay? <laughs> you said put in. <laughs> Published by Crystal Dynamics in 1996 and released for the Sega Saturn and PlayStation 1, Blazing Dragons was the brainchild of a team that included Monty Python's own Terry Jones, with the joke being that instead of humans fighting dragons in medieval times, the concept was reversed with dragons as the heroes and humans as the villains. Of course I was a little kid at the time, I wasn't aware of who Terry Jones was or what even Monty Python was. I just saw a game with cool looking dragons that played like my Freddy Fish games and I had to play. I don't see a lot of people talking about this game that much, so now as an adult I wanted to take a look back at it and see if it still holds up. We'll be playing the PlayStation 1 version because I've never owned or played a Sega Saturn. With what money? So starting the game with that iconic PS1 intro. I mean, look at these logos. Illusions is so good with those monsters under the bed. Oh, I love it. Crystal Dynamics logo is no slouch either. I remember being fascinated by all these crazy creatures and wondered where they came from. So, Blazing Dragons, if you can guess by the influence of Terry Jones, who also voices multiple characters in the game, is very much a comedy adventure game in the vein of other 90s titles like Monkey Island or Grim Fandango. I mean, this intro where we meet King Allfire of the Kingdom of Camel Hot and the Knights of the Square Table heading off to battle is just the best. <laughs> That car peeling away sound effect is just so, so damn funny. It cracks me up every time I hear it. So after the players introduced to the king and the knights, we also see this. More on that later. And we're brought to the surprisingly basic title screen. Nitpicking, but it's kind of a bummer that the title screen is so basic. It's a missed opportunity. You could have just thrown like a background from the game or I don't know, the overall map on there, something. So starting the game itself, we actually meet our villains. Sir George, a pink, human, evil knight working with his magician cohort Mervyn, not Merlin, Mervyn. Stupid joke, but get on this game's humor wavelength ASAP because it's just so, so goofy. One of Sir George's prized jewels has received a bite from his dragon enemies and wants to find a way to finally take control of Camelhot once and for all. Before we learn anything else, however, we cut to our protagonist, Flicker. He's not a knight, not royalty, but simply the castle inventor. We meet him sprawl in his bed having overslept as the court jester Trivet, played by Jones, comes to wake him up as King Allfire needs to speak with him. Flicker, hurry up, you lazy bag of dragon droppings. King Allfire's been waiting to see you. I just want to test the snooze lever one more time. I'll be down in nine minutes. Flicker hops out of bed and we finally gain control. Blazing Dragons is a point and click adventure game, as I said, but strangely enough, the PlayStation version is not compatible with the PlayStation mouse to move the cursor around the screen. Weird missed opportunity in my opinion, but using the D-pad to move the cursor isn't the worst thing in the world. The X button, or cross button, does anyone actually say that? The X button allows you to select objects while the shoulder buttons have you cycle through options like grab, talk, look, the usual adventure game actions. The triangle button brings the inventory in and out and that's it. A bit clunky compared to just, you know, pointing and clicking with a mouse, but it doesn't take long to adjust. The cursor moves pretty dang fast on screen, so it really isn't that arduous moving it around. Flicker immediately establishes himself as a fun character that's easy to root for. He's smart, cunning, extremely sarcastic, and is a bit of an underdog. He's in love with the king's daughter, Princess Flame, and 
and she shares his feelings. Unfortunately, however, she can only wed a knight and Flicker's not even a squire. To add a ticking clock as well, King Allfire is preparing a tournament for the knights and the winner will take Flame's hand in marriage and become the new King of Camelhot. There's a lot going on. At the same time, a frustrated Sir George proclaims that he too will have a contestant in the tournament, someone known as the Black Dragon to be precise. Once out of bed and having retrieved his self-proclaimed best invention, the Clicker, it grows on you. Flicker heads down to the square table. King Allfire sends his knights out to investigate Sir George's claims about the Black Dragon. Ooh! Blind idiot! And Flicker is put on dishwashing duty. Fun. And from the looks of it, Camel Hot goes through a lot of dishes. So here's the game's first puzzle. Find a way to do the dishes fast so you can leave the castle. It's relatively straightforward enough for a point and click game. Click on all of the things, all of them. You never know what odd object could be an integral item for your inventory. The game doesn't leave you dead in the water thankfully on this too, just mashing random items together hoping something will work. Flicker's an inventor after all, and what's an inventor without their own journal of ideas? This thing can be referred to at any time in the game to provide some potential hints on what you need to do for certain puzzles. It's a lovely organic way for providing players some help for anyone stuck on puzzles without being too overt and hand-holdy. So after grabbing a few knickknacks from around the castle, Flicker just straight up discovers steam power and invents an automatic dishwasher so he can leave the castle while his chores are handled. The King's Chancellor notices his new invention and is immediately intrigued. I see it's run off steam. Is it powerful? As powerful as a dozen knights. Fascinating. Perhaps later I can help you find some further uses for it. He seems friendly and so nice. With the tutorial puzzle out of the way, we can finally leave the castle and just go figure out what the heck the Knights of the Square Table are getting up to. And it's a lot. Using our new overworld map after speaking to this charming information booth dragon. Strange, but true. Every six minutes a mother dragon gives birth. I say we find that dragon and stop her! We head out into the kingdom of Camelhot to find the knights and bring them home. There's a narcissistic Sir Blaze who's just stuck at a lake staring at his exceptionally flirtatious reflection. King Allfire sent me on a mission and I've been here for hours. You're such a bad boy. Hey, big guy. I can't control my burning feelings of candy love. Good for them. Sir Bernevere finds himself trapped in the home of the grimly insane, featuring a Rapunzel terrified of her hair growing. and the most likely legally blind Sir Gastly has simply made a detour to the back of Camelhot Castle and seems to think King Allfire is Sir George. Come down and face your conqueror, Sir George! You've got the wrong castle, so blind as a bat! Now Flicker's gotta help them all and maybe one of them will let him become their squire. Naturally though, things don't go to plan. I won't be walking you through the game's puzzles for obvious reasons, but just know that each outlandish problem requires an equally outlandish solution, and it's just an absolute joy to witness how this game's universe works. The dialogue and voice acting is absolutely killer too. Uh, so anyway, how's your mum these days? <laughs> Buried her last week. Dead, you know. Once we got in the first three knights back home, one was already at the castle, but hey, the final knight, Sir Loungelot's location is revealed. It turns out he's found the Black Dragon and is prepared to challenge him to a duel. However, going up the hill as Flicker, we quickly discover that Sir George's Black Dragon is simply a machine, and a clunky one at that. With some puzzle solving from Flicker, we sabotage the machine and flatten some characters in the process. For Camelhot! That's it, coward! Run away! And it seems the threat's been averted. Hey, even Sir Loungelot agrees to make Flicker a squire. Unfortunately and unsurprisingly, Loungelot claims credit for defeating the Black Dragon and is lauded by Allfire, claiming he'll make a fine husband for Flame. The princess has had enough, however, and has Flicker help her escape from the castle so she won't be trapped into having to marry the knight. In the world's worst coincidence, however, Sir George and Mervyn are chilling just outside her window, and Flame's promptly kidnapped by the two humans. Not before Sir George is transformed into a few monstrosities for him. Don't ask. <laughs> Not only that, but the Chancellor has been secretly working for Sir George and steals Flicker's automatic dishwasher design. You can complain about predictability in game stories all day, but I've honestly never really understood why people complain about that. Like, just because you can guess that this character is evil, for example, doesn't make it bad. And with Blazing Dragons, this world is so imaginative and funny, like, they can do whatever the hell they want for the story. Like, I'm here for it. So with Sir George now having access to steam power, he begins prepping the Black Dragon 2, the sequel. Creative. Since Flame's now been kidnapped and Flicker again can't leave the castle due to being ordered to watch over her, we have to trick the king into thinking she's safe. So naturally, that involves some hypnotism. I love this part. Hey, sweet cakes. Trivet, what are we doing in the library? The last time I saw the king, he was in the square table room. You should go hop up on his lap 
You do look ravishing today. <laughs> You're quite a little freak, Trivet. I'm leaving. Hello, Daddy. Busy doing kingly things? Flicker, what are you doing? Now out of the castle again, Flicker has to infiltrate Sir George's castle and save Flame in the Knights again. More puzzle solving, a lot of hillbillies burning an effigy. <laughs> ben, Sir George! Ben! And this. Dance me for them on stage, girly dragon. I love this game so much. At this point, we can pretty much explore any area we want from the town on the outskirts of Sir George's Castle Grimm, featuring a juice tavern, how wholesome, along with a moat that's a little too intertwined with the place's plumbing. Ah, sweet relief. The cast opens up too to include a lot more humans. I'm especially a fan of these two monks here in the juice tavern who only accept prunes. The expected results naturally ensue. Real quick, I want to talk about the game's voice cast. Along with Terry Jones, other prominent actors featured here are Cheech Marin, Harry Shearer, Jim Cummings, Kat Soucy, Jeff Bennett, BJ Ward, Rob Paulson, the list goes on. Adventure games live and die by their writing, and having such an aces voice cast just sells every single joke. Like, even if you aren't particularly an adventure game fan, the game is worth experiencing yourself for the writing and voice acting alone. It's that good. Now, this was the 90s, so there are some jokes and stereotypes that wouldn't really hold up to today, but they're very, very minor, and some you probably wouldn't even notice, but more on that later. Now after, you guessed it, more silly puzzle solving and exploration, Flame and the Knights are rescued. The Black Dragon 2, the sequel, is also destroyed. And for his efforts, Flicker is crowned an official Knight of Camelhot. Not bad for only one day's work, honestly. The next day, we have to head over to the Cave of Dilemma to prove our worth to be a knight by participating in trials that sure are something. Also, I swear this guy on the cloud here is supposed to be like a Mel Brooks impression, right? Ah, problem number 449. No problem. I have the rest of my life to start my retirement. Well, we must do something about this immediately. Immediately, immediately. Harumph, 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 harumph. Heading to the tournament, we get to witness Flicker's ingenuity one more time through various trials that I really wish we could participate in gameplay-wise. Well, that's a lie, as we do get to play in the last match against Sir Loungelot. Dragon Thumb Wrestling. Careful not to mess it up, though. Okay, minor nitpick, I love this game, but I need to criticize it in some form. When you're holding down Loungelot's thumb, you have to mash the shoulder buttons to keep it down. The game doesn't tell you this, and it can be a bit confusing. Nitpick over. And there we have it. Flicker wins the tournament and wins Flame's handed marriage. And then another goddamn black dragon shows up. Jeez, Sir George works quick. Flicker is able to take out this third black dragon, and in his frustration, Mervyn fuses Sir George with its remains. Flame flees while George swallows not only King Allfire, but Mervyn and Flicker as well. We've used all of our inventory items that mean anything to us at this point, so what's an inventor turned squire turned knight to do? It's time to click. With a little bit of clicking trickery, we're able to mess with Mervyn. Also, hey, King Allfire, doing good? Comfortable? And destroys Sir George's plans once and for all. And crushes the Chancellor too by accident. Only something unpredictable and very heavy can stop me now. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet justice. And well, that's Blazing Dragons. A smaller experience for sure compared to some adventure games, but it takes a good five or so hours to play depending on how long you take to figure out the game's numerous puzzles. I obviously don't want to show you the full game to not ruin it, but man, is this thing such a fun time. And seriously, seriously underrated too. I never hear anyone bring this game up when talking about the adventure game genre heyday of the 90s. Charming characters, amazing writing and voice acting. Honestly, Blazing Dragons is decidedly a hidden gem of a game that I recommend everyone to check out. So Norman's is where we'd end, but wait, wait, don't click off this video just yet or anything on that sidebar either. And um, if you're watching this on TV, hello. Bet you didn't realize this game was a tie-in game. I did hint that the developer only worked on licensed games. So hey, yes, there was a Blazing Dragons TV show. We're dragons and we're bound to say. Yeah, honestly, as a kid, I didn't know this was a thing either. 
Blazing Dragons was an animated series also created by Terry Jones along with Gavin Scott that was produced in Canada by Nelvana. You know that company with the polar bear logo? And Ellipse Animation. This thing is hard to find having only aired some episodes in America on Toon Disney. Remember Toon Disney? It was all tied together too, as the game and show both launched in 1996. Now the only way I could find a way to watch it was to buy two episodes of it on Amazon, so yeah. If you want to check it out, there's going to be a price barrier, unfortunately. Watching the first episode of the show called The Quest for the Holy Quail, things are decidedly and extremely unlike the video game. For one, the art style is completely different, being much more flat and less detailed in comparison. The characters from the game are for the most part here. Flicker, Flame, King Allfire, Sir Lancelot, but there's quite a few additions and reconfigurations of the cast, with there now being a queen, Queen Griddle to be precise, along with additional knights of the square table like Sir Galahot and Sir Hot Breath. Trivet, the jester character voiced by Terry Jones in the game, is also nowhere to be found and is replaced, I guess, by Cinder and Clinker, a two-headed dragon jester. The biggest departure from the game is the villains, Sir George, the Chancellor, Mervyn, all gone. Instead, we get the human Count Jeffrey as our principal villain, and Merle the Wizard, a woman magician, instead. There's also Evil Knights numbers 1, 2, and 3, yes, brilliantly, those are their actual names, here to do Jeffrey's bidding. It's very weird to see a show and a game meant to tie together be so different, but hey, it makes more sense when you learn that the game wasn't supposed to tie in with the show in the first place. Yeah, Blazing Dragons was originally going to be an adventure game simply called Dragons of the Square Table. No tie-in at all. I guess it worked out though, as at some point the game was redesigned to work with the show. I mean, hey, to tie in your already heavily influenced by Monty Python adventure game in with a member of the group, it makes sense. Now to the show itself. I have to be honest, it's not that remarkable. The clever writing from the game is lost and the humor veers more towards broad physical comedy and stereotypes. Flicker's still kind of our protagonist, but he's less a sarcastic foil to the idiocy of the knights and more simply the straight man to their antics. Count Jeffrey is more bumbling than anything and the show really puts a lot of focus on Queen Griddle, who's loud and feels unloved by King Allfire and is very, very flirtatious with Sir Lancelot, who wants the throne for himself. There are some good jokes here to be sure, like the Holy Quail just straight up being a bird with a Pope like hat. <laughs> but the rest is just kind of your run-of-the-mill children's cartoon from the 90s. I only watched three episodes from the show, mind you, but what I saw was just... okay. Besides watching the first episode of the show, I watched the first set of episodes from the second season as well, where it seems Flicker has since been promoted to Knight and Flame is now blonde for some reason? Here, Sir Geoffrey gets a makeover from the Black Knight that actually makes him look a bit closer to Sir George from the game. Kind of cool. Besides that though, it's still kind of the same broad comedy from the other episode. But now there's more modern characters introduced. There's this one woman who shows up to give the royal court a makeover that's brutally, brutally 90s. And it just seems off. As the new dragon look. It's serving big rocket power energy. Lamo! Lamo! It was a Lamo! <laughs> <laughs> The other part of the season 2 premiere has an episode with this toy maker guy trying to destroy the dragons and he's just straight up a modern character. It's just odd. It doesn't really mesh and it feels like the show just didn't trust its solid dragons versus medieval humans premise enough. Bummer. So yeah, while the show was just okay, the game is great. Like, y'all need to check this thing out if you ever get the chance. As a big lover of adventure games, I really do think Blazing Dragons is one you don't want to miss. Sure, it's a bit short and a few of the puzzles are a little obtuse in their solutions, but the game encourages the player to really think out of the box. The crazy cast and setting helps too. A medieval Arthurian premise could easily be extremely tired and just the simple change of reversing the roles of humans and dragons makes it feel fresh and just a lot of fun. And while the puzzles don't change on replay like in the Humongous Us games for instance, there's always a chance you miss some hilarious piece of dialogue on the second go around, or you can just use the catapult again if you want. Hey that's nine! Poor thing. Blazing Dragons. Ignore the tie-in show and just play the game. It's underrated, no one talks about it ever, and it was one of my formative gaming experiences as a kid. I'm just really happy that it held up, like, check it out, I really don't think you'll regret it. And again, maybe don't watch the show, Sir Flame has changed from being a narcissist in love with himself into a bit of a stereotype. Sir Blaze, ready to service the king! Oops, sorry! Oh me, oh my, oh good gracious, ready to serve the hors d'oeuvres! The 90s were a mistake. Thank you so much for watching. I've been wanting to cover Blazing Dragons for a long time, so it's been great to finally, finally get to it. If you enjoyed watching, please consider leaving a comment below, giving the video a thumbs up, and hey, subscribing. Shout out to my patrons for this month with special mention of Jordan O'Neill. Thank you all so much for your support. Next video up is something Pokemon related, so please be excited. See you all later.